Democracy today is under threat from within and from without. From within, at least in my opinion, globalization had a lot to do with that. Globalization that helped lift a billion people out of poverty, created opportunity, created wealth, improved the quality of life, left people behind. Those people, especially in the industrialized world, in the manufacturing sector, felt angry and they found refuge in populist, nationalist politics. Um, I was in Slovakia recently and I found out that the neo-Nazi party that is gaining power now got the highest votes of first-time voters in Slovakia. That is a dangerous precedent. Um, this is repeated I mean, in the United States today, in, in the, my country. Um, more and more young people find that they need a, a strong leader and they'd rather have a strong leader than a democratic leader. Democracy, democracy is really in decline and this pattern is repeated in many parts of the world, in Asia, like in the Philippines, Latin America, Africa, Middle East, everywhere else, but especially in Europe. Um, in addition to this, some authoritarian regimes have taken advantage of open markets and openness around the world and through investments uh, have been able to push through governance gaps to benefit through corrupt behavior or even worse, open governance gaps in effect weakening democracy. And civil society has been at the vanguard for defending democracy all over the world. The question that we pose today is what is the role of business? And when we talk about business, we're not talking about the oligarchs. We're not talking about uh, uh, crony capitalists. We're talking about the business that would benefit from open markets, from transparency, from accountability. These businesses that when there's more openness, more transparency, they win, they gain. What is their role? Do they have a role? Have they played enough of a role or not? And for that, we have assembled, in my opinion, a really fantastic uh, group of experts. Um, I will start with uh, Yunuts uh, Sibian from Romania. He is a true civil society expert in local civil society. In his role in the Civil Society Development Foundation has raised the capacity of many, many organizations. But he also, he's also a member of the EU's European Economic and Social Committee. He is truly the voice of the European civil society in Brussels. So he brings in an expertise, uh, uh, local and global perspective. Peter, who's with us, unfortunately, uh, only by voice for now. Oh, he's also here. I, sh I see he share my uh, quaff. Nice to meet you, uh, Peter. He is a business leader. As, CE as CEO of Prezi, a multinational software company, um, and as a business leader in the IT sector, he knows China very well. Uh, but also plays a main role as the founder of Bridge Budapest in getting over 900 companies to work together in, as a business integrity network. He's an expert on collective action and in the private sector. Martin, to my left, Martin Hala is from the Czech Republic. He is uh, a sinologist, but is, uh, in particular, he knows China's foreign activities and their impact on politics, governance, and economy in the Czech Republic and other countries in the region. I highly recommend that you read his paper, recently published called Confronting the Challenge of Authoritarian Corrosive Capital. Last but definitely not least is Romena Filipova from Bulgaria. She's a researcher, a top expert on Russia, and at the Center for the Study of Democracy. Uh, she's an expert on Russian politics, economic, and media influence in, the, in Central and Eastern Europe. But her claim to fame with Scythe is she has been the lead researcher on a study on the corrosive effects of Russian capital flows in the uh, Western Balkans. So, I hope we can have a conversation here today instead of you presenting. So I'll start with a question to Jonitz. Um, Europe, in my opinion, owes its freedoms, owes its democratic development to civil society. And, and I, I have a global perspective. I oversee programs in many parts of the world. And maybe that's the secret ingredient that allowed uh, Europe to succeed, while Middle East, Africa, other countries in the world did not succeed. Uh, you recently convened civil society from the European Union. Uh, can you tell us some of the takeaways for Brussels, some of the takeaways for the European Union, and if you can follow up, what is the role of the private sector in all of this? Uh, thank you. I'll try to, to be brief and to answer to these three questions. So I will start with uh, 
Romania and the EU presidency. We had this rotated president, rotative presidency of, of the EU Council and with a very um, unfriendly government that for two years and a half was uh, blaming civil society and business sector, and I will mm. come back to, to that, uh, that we are not patriots, uh, that we um, um, go and uh, say un uh, things that are not truth in Brussels and to the, to the embassies, that we are kind of betrayers. Uh, and um, we try to, to, to left outside these issues and to work with them during the presidency and to convince them that one of the priorities should be European values. And this was the only thing during the presidency, the topic of European values that brought us together and we worked together. And we organized a meeting uh, together, chaired by the Romanian president, uh, with uh, 28 countries, civil society organizations there, and we achieve an important thing, having four-page document for the new institutions, for the parliament, about what are the requests for civil society, what is the vision of civil society for European Union for the next five years. This you could find it on, on our website, and I will try to, to point some of the most important issues there. So basically, we try to uh, uh, convince the members of the parliament, uh, the commission, the council, the new leaders, that without civil society and without uh, uh, the support of civil society towards the values that are the fundamentals of the uh, European construction, everything will fall apart. We will not survive just with the common market. The common market was not there in the beginning, it was the values. And that's why uh, it's important to protect civil society because what it, ha it happened in several countries, it was civil society, the space was restricted, in, including in my country. So our proposals are uh, um, ones that will reopen uh, the space for civil society in order to be a uh, real and defender and enabler of uh, um, uh, protecting uh, um, uh, values such human rights, rule of law, oh, uh, equal opportunity, cohesion, solidarity, but also prosperity. Because if communities outside the big cities in Czech Republic, Romania, Poland will not see the prosperity coming with the membership of the EU, the prosperity coming with uh, uh, um, full-fledged democracy, then they will always uh, be very sensitive to the message of populists. And if you look to our document, you know, we are going to some proposal how we could work better civil society in order to counter uh, argue uh, on the populist message in our country. And another very important part of, of, of our document and how you empowered existing uh, structures like fundamental rights agency to monitor the civic space, to have early warning reports that will go to the parliament. And these are European institutions. It's not that my organization is doing a report and then the members of European parliament questioning you know, our legitimacy. No, we should use the existing uh, institution in order to defend civic space. And also it's important how we di direct funding for the next uh, uh, five years, because the funding on the, uh, uh, that EU provides for civil society uh, uh, currently, it's you know 10 years uh, uh, behind of the things that are happening. So a lot of our proposals are in this direction. And one of the proposals in this direction is philanthropy, because we are talking here about business sector. So one of the initiatives that we have, the civil society in Romania, and the government ask for it, and now it's in debate in the parliament, and how you enable philanthropy across border and across EU countries. Because we have a, 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 um, uh, the freedom of, uh, uh, goods, uh, the freedom of people to, to, to commute, to travel. But what about philanthropy? 
moving from one country to the country, across the border, when you have all these unfriendly uh, governments, this could be a, a solution for, for us. And this is already a measure, a proposal of ours, and the document we produced in the European Economic and Social Committee, the Romanian team, and now it's in the European Parliament, endorsed by all the groups except the uh, um, anti-European, uh, the Eurosceptic groups. And the last thing, it's uh, uh, your question about business and third sector and how we succeed in Romania. Not because uh, we had a vision or something, it, it, it was the events that pushed us together because it was two images on TV, maybe you remember the, in 2018, in February, 2017 in February, the million of people going on the streets against <laughs> this ordinance of the government, you know, almost uh, freeing all the uh, uh, politicians that they were convicted for high corruption. So we went on the street civil society, but there will, will never be, uh, we never succeed to be more than 25,000. This was the best scenario. So business sector was with us for the first time and we were blamed. It was uh, the head of Raiffeisen in Romania, together with three or four of us from civil society, blamed by the government and TV station, obeying to, to government as the uh, uh, financer uh, uh, of, of uh, the whole stuff. So it put us, you know, to work together, to find solution together because we were attacked. And now in Romania there are corporations, like for instance the biggest food retailer, providing uh, 1.5 million euros per year from nothing two years ago for uh, projects in the communities uh, where they uh, work, for projects in the area of uh, uh, um, equal opportunities, rights, sexual education, um, um, act, uh, civic education in the school, things that three years ago, if you, if I would have go, went for a meeting with them, they would have said, okay, some social services and that all. We will not cover anything from these areas that I already mentioned. And these three years, you know, make us to work, um, force us to, to work together because also their environment was restricted. The, the, the environment, business environment, so it was hand in hand restricting civic space, uh, um, uh, business environment, and also the increasing corruption that would have made their life in Romania uh, very difficult. So I think uh, it's, we could say that we have a model in Romania, I hope we'll keep this, uh, 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 this, uh, um, wave going and developing uh, uh, further and I think civil society will be not sustainable in our part of, of uh, Europe without a strong support from, from the business sector. This is, uh, this is the future. Thank you very much. Um, that's a good example from Romania, but Peter, I'm going to go next to you. Uh, we heard from Romania. Oh, is he still with us? Yeah. Okay. All right. So at least by voice. <laughs> um, you're a, okay, thank you. Uh, you're a good example of a business leader that's engaged in civic activity, in uh, uh, collective action against corruption. Um, on behalf of everybody here, tell us, what's in it for you? What's in it for the company? Why do you do it? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think that um, the, um, you know, having companies that create value and see uh, their role as serving society is absolutely essential part of having a, a, a functioning democracy and a, and a functioning country, period, probably. And I was very fortunate to grow up and uh, be born in Sweden, where I saw this working very well. You may know that uh, there are all these global brands, uh, from Volvo to ABB to Spotify being a current one, uh, that proves to people who have the opportunity to be born and, and grow up in Sweden that there is a great um, um, collaboration in society that can happen if you have companies taking responsibility and building products that, uh, that is desired globally. And it, it uh, provides for a welfare society where people can have uh, good education, good health care, uh, and uh, a large group of people can be provided with dignity. And everyone, in my, my sense, is that a lot of people, at least in Sweden, understands this implicitly, uh, this, this social contract. 
Uh, and uh, I moved to Hungary to start Prezi, uh, basically because my two co-founders are from there, but also my two parents. And at home, I learned Hungarian, and I, I got exposed to, of course, a very different way um, uh, of uh, being. And I wanted to bring some of the goodness from Sweden uh, with me uh, to, to Hungary. And, and part of that is just building a decent business that gives people great opportunities for growth uh, in their work. Uh, obviously makes a product that people want to have around the world and, and uh, of course, also builds value for shareholders. The, this, this may sound like uh, basic uh, things, but, uh, you know, in a society where we've only had um, market economy for a few decades, this is not evident. And um, I think the thing that uh, I work... Uh, so much for with Bridge Budapest is to try to illustrate what those examples look like in Hungary. Uh, in these last six years that we've been around with Bridge Budapest, we've not only shown people examples that yes, global success can be achieved through hard work and a good idea, um, but also uh, we are now sort of getting into the next phase of it, which is where we're creating knowledge transfer uh, between people and, and we're, we're uh, trying to breathe life in a business community uh, that is different from, I would say, the business community that developed through privatization and all of those things. Th these are people, entrepreneurs, who are um, wanting to build a value from scratch, from their, from their own ideas, and, and these are also people who, frankly, are having to face... Um, uh, an image of what entrepreneurship looks like that is very different from what I got to experience in Sweden, for example. So, so there's a lot of work actually that needs to happen to establish, I think, the things that we, we talk about here. And, you know, Sweden had the fortune to have 200 years of peace and uh, be able to uh, build these global uh, companies. Now, in, in Hungary, if we get 200 years to do this, I'm sure we can do it, but I'd like to do it in shorter order of time. Let's, let's hope so, but just a quick follow-up, and if you can answer within a minute. Was there any damage to your business because of your activism, because of your collective action? Did it hurt you at all? No, I think, in fact, what, what you know, we see is that uh, a lot of talented people come our way. Uh, next to Bridge Budapest, we have uh, another NGO that we started called We Are Open. Uh, this is companies that uh, promote uh, diversity as a way of generating creativity and great results. And young people want to be in a place uh, where they can have a meaningful job and a growth opportunity. Often this comes through creativity. And what we see in Hungary is that these companies attract the top talents of the country. And sometimes we even manage to bring people home from, say, London or Berlin, uh, where a lot of them have, have moved because of the, the stressful situation that, that exists now. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn to Romaina, if I may. Um, well, I talked a little bit about the study of uh, the patterns of uh, investment in the Western Balkans. Briefly, you can tell, tell us a little bit about the conclusions, some of the conclusions. So uh, the main conclusion that has emerged from our self-supported study into Russian corrosive capital in the Western Balkans is that indeed uh, Russia's corrosive capital has negative uh, repercussions for the economies of the Balkan countries, which in turn entail uh, significant political consequences. So more specifically, Russia's economic presence, which consists of um, uh, investment, foreign direct investment, also corporate presence and bilateral trade relationships uh, has eroded the uh, economic growth of uh, Balkan countries and it has also negatively affected fiscal stability, uh, which uh, the Kremlin has been able to do in a variety of ways, for instance, by uh, uh, being able to force large state-owned uh, companies into bankruptcy, also being able to affect critical energy supplies to interrupt those. Uh, 
supplies also it has been able to affect critical value added chains um, uh, in the economy and also to inflict significant budget revenue pain. And so when this is uh, taken as a whole, uh, together with the absence of significant democratic defenses in uh, Balkan countries, this has narrowed the policy options available to uh, Balkan politicians, which means that this uh, economic influence that uh, the Kremlin has been uh, able to exercise is also converted into a political influence, into affecting the uh, political and strategic uh, choices available to Western Balkan countries. And um, how and why is uh, this uh, happening? Um, this is so, what emerges from our research is that this is so because of the interaction of domestic factors facilitating the influx, the inflow of Russian corrosive capital, and also when this is amplified by the strategies employed by uh, the Kremlin. So to echo what you said at the beginning, the threat is both from within and from without. And just to uh, sum it up briefly, the key domestic uh, factor which has facilitated the Russian corrosive capital is a key governance vulnerability that is shared by all of the uh, Western Balkan countries and which is the uh, compromised character of their uh, internal accountability and oversight uh, procedures. And uh, the Kremlin has been very successful at uh, leveraging this uh, vulnerability in order to entrench its presence and to also further cultivate uh, an opaque network, an opaque networks of patronage across the Balkans. And uh, these um, networks consist of local kleptocrats uh, who have who exercise influence over state administrations, and they have, of course, close uh, uh, ties to pro-Russian or Russian uh, groups and businesses. And the Kremlin is able in to um, leverage those groups in order to um, achieve its preferred outcomes. Um, which brings me to the external side, so to say, the, uh, what the Russia has done in order to enable its influence. And it has employed a range of tools and levers to do so, and in particular to cement its influence in key vulnerable uh, sectors of the economies. Of Can you give us specific Western. examples of these sectors or specific yeah. in, in countries? Yeah, so if we take energy, because this is the most uh, important sector over which the Kremlin exercises influence, so its goal has been to reduce um, competition and to entrench its dominant position in the energy sectors of those countries. And uh, for example, if we take the gas sector, for instance, how the Kremlin has been able to do so is by striking um, a long-term uh, long gas contracts, which are on, on terms unfavorable to Western country, uh, Western Balkan countries, also being able to install uh, gas uh, company intermediaries, which have close ties uh, to the Kremlin, also through the promotion of the big mega uh, uh, gas pipeline projects, and generally through very consistent efforts uh, to block all attempts at market um, liberalization and also diversification of the sources of energy, not just the transit routes of energy. Uh, and of course, uh, non-transparent um, uh, privatization processes have been a very important way in which the Kremlin has been able to seize uh, strategic assets. And I should say that uh, the list goes on and on, and uh, we can take, for instance, the uh, financial insurance and banking sector. And uh, uh, here again, the main strategy on the part of the Kremlin has been to open branches of Russian state-owned banks like uh, VTB, like uh, Sberbank, and then uh, to exploit defaults on unsustainable loans. And in addition, uh, the Kremlin has been suspected of conducting uh, money laundering operations. And then we have the real <laughs> estate and transportation <laughs> and the mining. Thank you. There's a lot. And if you're interested in the report or more questions about it, please corner uh, uh, her in some, some place and ask her questions. She'll give you the report. I know, you know you want to ask a question, but let me, before I go that, let me get into the Russian influence over, I'm sorry, the Chinese influence over this part of the world from Martin and the sharp power they use, uh, if, if I may. And then I can give a chance to ask a question. Well, uh, <clears throat> Uh, you know, there's been a 
there's been a very steep uh, rise in Chinese influence, or I would even call it interference in this uh, part of the world, in this region. This is in fact what m motivated originally our project. So we started it um, three years, four years ago as sort of like a, like a crisis response to this new phenomenon. Uh, because there was uh, one of the one of the factors that uh, facilitated this 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 fast rise in China's impact on Central and Eastern Europe was the knowledge asymmetry, uh, where the uh, uh, you know on the East European side there was uh, very little knowledge of what contemporary China looks like and how some of these mechanisms actually work. And uh, we are a group of sinologists based at the university, but also sinologists with um, a history of, um, let's say, social involvement or, or civil society involvement. So we sort of uh, considered that our duty to do something about, about that. So uh, we started this project to essentially inform public uh, about some of the aspects of this phenomenon that were not so uh, obvious and that were uh, um, not really um, available from um, mainstream media and, and other such sources of information. Now in terms of uh, business, unfortunately we've seen it from the more negative side. So the, uh, the uh, you know, business um, and commercial companies played mostly a, a negative role in, in this whole phenomenon and in the, in the relationship between China and uh, and Central and Eastern European part, uh, countries, and, and uh, specifically the Czech Republic. Uh, and not only uh, Chinese companies, but also some Czech companies on our side that have behaved in, uh, let's say, less than transparent way. And uh, the Czech Republic is actually a, a, a great case study of what everything can go wrong in um, the relationship with China. and. Uh, in uh, something that uh, from the Chinese side is often called economic diplomacy. Uh, it, uh, we've seen a, a, a very fast rise uh, of uh, this uh, engagement uh, after 2014, but then equally sharp decline uh, since last year when uh, the, the major company that uh, the major Ch Chinese company that essentially monopolized the relationship between the Czech Republic and China and was advertised uh, at um, one moment uh, as the flagship of Chinese investment in, uh, in the Czech Republic collapsed in a spectacular way and had um, uh, some of its um, executives arrested uh, simultaneously in uh, New York and in China. Uh, some of them has, have since been sentenced for large-scale international corruption. So it's, it's sort of a cautionary tale that, um, uh, you know, in minute details actually describe what, what, what the downside of um, um, this relationship is. Uh, much of it I have described in that paper that uh, you have mentioned, but I don't think it has been published yet. I think it's still undergoing peer review, as, um, unless I missed something. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Thank you. I'm going to go back to you quickly. I'm, I'm going to ask you a question, then I'll allow you uh, units to, to come in, but I'm coming to you also. Um, we heard about all these problems, but what can be done about it? Any policy recommendations, anything the other business community can do, civil society, what can be done about it? Well, the, uh, you know, uh, what we've been trying to do about it is to uh, uh, bring some more transparency into it and first of all analyze the, the whole situation and, and it describes some of the mechanisms um, uh, at work in these processes. So, in, you know, specifically in terms of um, China's influence in the region, there are very specific bureaucracies on the Chinese side, uh, very specific policies that have been driving it. Um, they're not uh, entirely secret. You can get the, policy doc the relevant policy documents. Um, you, can, uh, you can read some of the uh, policy discussions that are being, uh, some of the policy discussions in China. Uh, so we've been trying to shed some light on the process on the basis of uh, the study and analysis of uh, uh, the Communist Party of China's own 
documents. So that's step one. The second step is uh, you have to look at the relationship also from the local side. So specifically uh, in the case of the Czech Republic, we've seen a, a major, indeed massive, conflict of uh, interest, uh, which is a direct result of something I call the elite capture, basically if, um, a co-opting of part of the political elites by uh, various Chinese entities. And again, in, in the case of the Czech Republic, it was this one Chinese company which has now been uh, um, uh, essentially sentenced already um, uh, because of large-scale poli large, large political corruption in Africa. But they, uh, you know, they, they, we, we, we have no evidence of outright corruption in the Czech Republic. But you can assume that if a company has a certain model of operation in, a, in one part of the world, it probably doesn't uh, operate in a very different um, uh, way elsewhere. So, uh, you know, because of this um, corrosive influence on, on um, some, of the, um, uh, some of the democratic structures in the Czech Republic, the elite capture, there developed a, a, a huge conflict of interest in some of the some of the major some of the some of the very important Czech institutions, where you cannot be sure whether those particular institutions or some individuals in them at least uh, represent Chinese or Czech uh, interests and uh, what exactly their their function and, and the whole relationship is. So that's another thing you have to look at the conflict of interest perhaps strengthen the conflict of interest uh, legislation, bring some more transparency, insist on transparency uh, in, in the mutual relationship, and uh, of course also reciprocity. Um, thank you. Um, so I, I think that one of the successful story, because you asked about solutions in the case of Romania, it was for instance, all the pro bono work that was done during the two years and a half protest by the creative industry and IT industry. So everything was, because we didn't have the, the uh, know-how, we didn't have uh, the money to do it, so basically everything that was online and also the fancy things uh, in the demonstrations, it was done by these industries. And sometimes, you know, the owner, especially in the creative industries, because they are doing PR also for a governmental agency, they say, we cannot do that because we'll be out of the contract. But it was the people that they employ that they say will not work for the company anymore. And Romania has a big shortage of people, the talents are living abroad. So they were forced in the IT industry and the creative industry in order to, you know, to, to uh, let the uh, uh, people, uh, employ people to, to be part of, of it. So all the, uh, I think the successful, it was, uh, 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 they contributed a lot to this and we've done it differently. And I think now is the momentum, you know, to uh, put this energy to, uh, uh, on the, on the, at work. And we will have a new government in Romania. I hope that will be uh, um, uh, some uh, uh, good time ahead in order to, to uh, create programs together, to work more with the communities, to involve more communities that we serve, and also at the European level to be more solid among us, to put these models, you know, to, to uh, I don't know, to go to Hungary, to, to tell them that it's possible, already it's, it's possible, and uh, um, yeah, to work more at the and central and eastern level. And learn from each, from each other. You have something to add? And I'm, I'm yeah. really, if you have a question, please raise your hand so I come to you uh, immediately after this. I'll, I'll keep looking at you as she's speaking. I would just uh, like to focus on three uh, recommendations or things that can be done to Good. counteract the inflow of corrosive capital. First, on the civil society level, I think it's important for civil society to be involved, for instance, through the creation of civil society councils or watchdogs, which uh, scrutinize the terms and contracts um, that are concluded between Russia, China, and the governments of the Western Balkan. Uh, countries and uh, this is so given the secretive government to government nature of these loans the, and the fact that the terms of those loan agreements are not usually disclosed to the public so there should be greater public demand to see those terms 
And uh, in addition to that, I think it's important to create uh, expert task forces, for instance, which can draw on the expertise of NGOs, but they can also attract uh, European and uh, American expertise uh, in addition to that to assess the pros and cons of um, entanglements with Russia and China. And I was just fascinated to read the example of Myanmar, um, where USAID brought a team of experts uh, to develop technical capacity for due diligence in order for the people to be able to understand what are the pros and cons of uh, entangling themselves with China. And then in terms of um, the provision of expertise and part of the work that uh, we are conducting with SAIP at the moment is the development of instruments uh, for measuring state capture and for deploying those instruments in a wider way and disseminating the knowledge that comes from them to uh, the public. So uh, an instrument that we have is called a MAC. B1, uh, which is about monitoring uh, anti-corruption uh, policy implementation, uh, and it focuses on uh, anti-corruption uh, policy designs, gaps, but also gaps in, inform uh, in enforcement uh, and legislation. So this is one of the ways in which um, uh, NGOs can contribute with uh, expertise and help the public uh, uh, orientate in this complex uh, matter. And, and just finally, uh, in what was already said, the importance of creativity and uh, uh, innovation, the importance of developing innovative solutions to social and economic problems through um, public-private dialogue, because um, we conduct an annual survey on, um, uh, on innovation policy and strategy in Bulgaria specifically. Uh, and uh, what we have found out is that there is a consistent and wide uh, discrepancy among how the central government, local authorities, businesses and universities uh, think of innovation, innovation practices, and also the implementation of the EU's smart specialization policy uh, in that respect. And so we, uh, we find uh, that all these, the private, the public sector, the universities, tend to be confined to uh, their own specific spheres of research, development, and innovation, and there is not much uh, dialogue. And so just to uh, illustrate uh, briefly, only 34% of the university's R&D budgets tend to be channeled into enterprises, and this is even lower for businesses. So just 22% of business R&D uh, budgets are channeled into university research. So uh, then again, uh, the importance of innovative solutions through Thank you. Um, dialogue. Thank you very much. It, it seems to me that uh, none of the solutions involve stopping this capital from flowing in. It's mostly about improving the resiliency in the recipient countries, whether through uh, transparent, uh, transparency, accountability, cooperation amongst international donors, but more about strengthening the, the economy where this capital is coming from rather than stopping it at the border. Uh, any question? We can ask you questions. <laughs> Let me pose a question to you and here. Uh, I was intrigued by uh, uh, Prime Minister Sandu's comments earlier today when she said, talked about the nostalgia and how uh, we're looking back, hearkening into the times before 1989. My question is, why aren't we looking at what has happened over the past 30 years and comparing it to what happened before it? and actually celebrating that. Look at what's happened since. It's good. Yes, right now democracy is a retreat, but we're comparing, uh, we're not using the success stories, the open markets, the opportunities that have opened and saying, look what we're comparing to. Is it something we should use or are we just ignoring it completely? Martin? Maybe I can uh, weigh in on that here. Because, um, I mean, I think this is the most crucial point, uh, and that's actually what we do with both Bridge Budapest and with We Are Open out of Hungary. Um, my sense is, uh, as I said before, we have a cultural challenge where we need to develop possibility models for what, you know, particularly for young people, what the future can look like. I say this because when we do a survey with Bridge Budapest, we see that entrepreneurship and business uh, has a lot of negative connotations to it in Hungary. You know, corruption, nepotism, all of these things come up very 
uh, they rise up to the top when it uh, when you uh, look at this terms of, of um, entrepreneurship. And if we want long term change of the narrative, then we have to also promote alternatives that show show a different way of doing things. And my ex uh, my experience is that young people actually just want to you know do a meaningful job and feel like they can be rewarded for, for the work that they do. But what society tells them in, in a lot of places right now, and it's not just Central and Eastern Europe, is that you know the, the, the system is rigged uh, in some ways. And, and until we create um, um, opportunities for hope and um, excitement about what can be done, then uh, then we won't have a significant change in our, our societies, in, 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 is my belief. Um, yeah, I'll just pause there. Well, uh, I am myself certainly celebrating the last 30 years. I have, you know, I've been having a good time. Uh, if, uh, I, I think it's, you know, since I left, uh, about half of my life before 1989 and uh, half since, I certainly do appreciate the difference. And um, uh, I think many people of my generation, people with similar experience would not want to go back. But uh, we also have to realize that um, we're very often shooting ourselves in the leg. So the, um, you know, the, the relative decline of the attractiveness of liberal democracy in the past few years um, uh, has certain causes, right? We could argue about what these causes are, and Peter has mentioned some. Um, I personally think that uh, some of the major crises um, in the last decade, starting with the with the financial crisis, crisis in uh, 2008, and then the euro crisis, and in particular then the refugee crisis, uh, undermined the, um, the the belief in um, in uh, liberal democracy and the consensus that we once had here in this part of the world in the 90s, uh, that this is indeed the direction in which we want to develop. So, you know, part of the damage um, has been done by ourselves, so to speak. And of course, with the relative decline of the, of the liberal demo democratic model comes the, you know, the relative rise of, the, of all sorts of alternatives. Um, um, uh, so uh, that has already happened, the damage has been done. Now we have to explain to people that these alternatives uh, may really not be such a good choice after all and explain to them what exactly lies at the bottom of, uh, of these systems that some people now look up to, like for instance the, uh, the, you know, the proverbial China model. Um. I will. I, uh, I remember now that uh, in the 90s we had a political commenter uh, that was part of the communist regime and he was part of the people that uh, um, betrayed Ceausescu. And he had on TV uh, every week uh, um, a show of one hour about prediction about the future. And in 90, he he was called Brukan. Uh, and in 90, he said, in 1990, that we need at least 25 to 30 years to reach the level of the countries in the Western Europe. And everyone hated him. They, they thought that uh, he, uh, um, you know, he's unrealistic and he doesn't want us to, to, to live better. Now we are 30 years after and we are not there. Maybe Bucharest and some face, uh, fancy cities in Romania. So these were the expectation of the Eastern and Central Eastern Europe. And there was no politician, you know, bold enough and courageous to tell them, guys, this will take generation to, to, to be there. This is a long uh, um, way that we, we have to do it. On the other side, you had, we lost the narrative with all these populists that they blame uh, the corruptions, that they, uh, b the corrupted uh, uh, political system, that uh, uh, they blame the fact that uh, it's just foreigners uh, uh, are taking the advantage of our economy, the fact that it's just the fancy NGOs and 
business people from big cities that they afford to travel and they are the winner of uh, these 30 years. So I think here is uh, the, the big problem, how those people that are still in Romania and in Poland, more than 45% living in the rural areas, how those people will gain, will, will you know, their life will be improved because of this transition, because the EU membership, otherwise they will become Eurosceptics, otherwise they will be very easy targets for, uh, for uh, uh, populists. So I think we, we have some lesson learned after these 30 years, and I hope civil society, politicians, uh, business sector, we will treat differently our communities and we'll try to do the things different. Um, I was really um, fascinated to listen to Maya Sandu's speech uh, in the morning and I was thinking about the situation in Moldova right now, in Ukraine, in North Macedonia, that there is currently a Europeanization impetus. And I was also thinking that perhaps Bulgaria and Romania were looking like that uh, in the late 90s, early to mid 2000s, where w when we had this great impetus to join the EU and NATO. And uh, I think for most of these Central and East European countries, the process of transition to a market economy and democratization was associated with uh, Europeanization. So these two were um, entangled and when the, these goals were achieved, for, for instance, when Bulgaria and Romania joined the EU in 2007 uh, uh, and when that happened earlier for the Central uh, European countries, it, perhaps there was a feeling that the main goals were achieved. And so there was a greater feeling of uh, self-confidence, but perhaps complacency. And um, there was um, a relaxation. And so I think that we need to f find again the impetus for uh, change and excitement, as uh, Peter mentioned at the beginning, that is uh, currently observed in uh, countries like Moldova, Ukraine, and North Macedonia. And if there's no more questions, I'm going to ask another question out of, uh, from Peter. And then you can also be in, get engaged in this one. Um, there's a perception that um, businesses are the ones that benefited the most out of this openness, out of the accession to Europe, with more opportunities, more uh, wealth available. If that is the case, Peter, do you feel that the uh, businesses, the private sector, has been able to leverage this wealth, these opportunities, um, into the g overall good of the countries they're in. Did you hear me, Peter? Uh, well, I actually, sorry, I did not hear your question because it was a little bit distorted on my end. So I'm just realizing now that you were asking me I'll, if you could. I'll, I'll, repeat, yeah. I'll repeat it but, uh, quickly. So again, the perception is that the businesses are the ones that benefited the most out of the openness, the open markets, democratic development, accession yeah. to Europe and all of that with opportunities, wealth. Uh, uh, do you feel these businesses have leveraged it enough to help uh, the overall populations? Got it, thank you. Yeah, no, my sense is that no, we have not at all lived with the opportunity. And, and I think Prezi is a great example of that. Uh, we started Prezi in the midst of the, the recession um, and uh, we took on Apple, Microsoft, and Google, only the world's largest companies. And, and frankly, nobody believed in us, in, including even European leaders. Uh, and we showed that, it, yeah, in, in the market dominated by these three giants, we can actually make inroads and, and be competitive. And my belief is that there are many, many other opportunities out there. Uh, or entrepreneurs anywhere around the world. Uh, it just it happens to be that in Central and Eastern Europe, we have a relatively educated population that we know, at least on the engineering side, I can talk about this uh, with, with great confidence, is, is world class. Now, we do miss some of the know-how of, of, you know, how to build globally successful uh, organizations, how to scale them rapidly, all of these things we, we miss a lot of know-how about, but I believe that if we, you know, whether that's from a uh, governmental or bottom-up societal level, put our efforts into uh, becoming competitive as societies, we absolutely could because still, even with some of the challenges we're seeing today, 
the world is relatively more open and more global than what it has ever, ever been in, in the past. As long as you have something that you can uh, build that's valuable to others, you have an opportunity to play. Our issue is uh, that we believe ourselves that we can't do this. Mm. Our issue is that our in narrative in Central and Eastern Europe is that we're always victim to the larger power either in the West or in the East. And until we change that narrative, we, we, won't, we will never be able to step outside of this world that we've taken upon us. Anybody want to comment on that? Well, uh, I feel that uh, here in Eastern Europe, uh, we have uh, essentially two kinds or even two generations of companies. So we have the, the, the companies like, like, like Peter mentioned, who came out from the creat creativity and entrepreneurship of the local people. And then we have uh, a lot of companies uh, that came out of the privatization uh, through a totally different uh, process. And I think that we are certainly here in the Czech Republic, we are now paying the price for the original sin of uh, mismanaging the privatization process uh, back in the 90s. Um, as many of you here will be aware, the Czech Republic essentially is run now by two oligarchic groups, you know, both of them originating uh, from from the privatization in the 90s. So I think that's one of the major issues here in uh, in Central and Eastern Europe and um, uh, you know that that is the that is the elephant in the room really. Uh, I totally agree with that and in addition we can probably draw some uh, differences uh, on a sub-regional basis. So if we compare Central and Eastern Europe uh, and also the Balkans, uh, Southeast Europe, and just as a general mechanism, of course this can be uh, qualified and uh, there are differentiations within, but in the Balkans this problem of um, uh, privatization uh, was even more pronounced in a negative way. So privatization laws were created in order for the former nomenclatura to be able to retain its high positions in society, in the economy, in a very rapacious manner, uh, which uh, didn't have uh, much to do with an ideal type of entrepreneurship or uh, free enterprise. Uh, as you say, perhaps uh, this was also present in Central Europe, but still uh, there was an element in which at least the technocratic parts of the former elite cooperated with the in intelligentsia, with the intellectuals that led the transition and uh, at least they were responsible for leading the way into the creation of a market economy in a so-called a capitalist uh, um, society. So still there are some uh, differences between Central Europe and Southeast Europe. That yeah. In Romania, all those guys that they've done the privatization and they were the new oligarchs, new barons, they are in jail. And this is because of the justice in Romania. Uh, the justice system, and th that's why we went on the street and to defend it, because it was, uh, it was essential. So now you have in Romania a lot of uh, entrepreneurs, you know, that are more optimistic that they will, could keep their business in, in Romania. It's not just Bucharest, you have Cluj, where you have huge uh, uh, IT uh, uh, center now. It's going to Yash, to the eastern side of, of, of the country. So there are premises for the young entrepreneurs to do uh, things in Romania. And there are also the, the uh, classical companies, investment companies in Romania from abroad, that they also suffered because of uh, of the justice, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, rule in Romania. For instance, the Oracle. All of you, you know, Oracle. So their CEO in Romania actually is now uh, out of. Uh, uh, um, it's in, it's uh, actually asked by the courts because there are in the court because there are. Uh, it's about uh, uh, that he was bribing basically. So the justice went also in the private sector when there was uh, cases where they bribed bri bri public administration. So this department of anti-corruption that usually was supposed to look just for the public uh, uh, sector. So I think this is important. Again, Microsoft was paying a lot of money back because they sell uh, for, for uh, they increase the price for uh, the um, uh, their product, so uh, I think this is uh, this is uh, 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 important, and I think uh, this uh, uh, it gives the chance for 
more, um, let's say, how, how to call it, more open CEO that they came afterwards towards working with community, towards working with civil society, towards working to transparency. And that's important thing, I think, for, for, for our country. Thank you very much. And uh, on behalf of the organizers, I'd like to read uh, like the last three points that uh, uh, we were supposed to distill. The first one is that there is a role for business and civil society to work together. Now, which businesses we need to be careful, right? Not the results of the privatization, but the innovative, technologically um, uh, inclined companies uh, to work with civil society towards developing democracy and defending against democracy decline. The um, other point is, the, the, again, the threat of corrosive capital. What it means, how it affects, uh, it takes governance gaps, how it uh, attacks democracy, and the need for us to work together on the resiliency of the res recipient economies to make sure they're able to fight against that. And finally, the point I added is companies that benefited from all of this, uh, we need to go back and make them understand the benefits they had over the past 30 years and that they have a role to play. So to celebrate the successes and to use these successes to convince the private sector and the population overall is that we need to defend these gains that we've had in, the, in, the, in defending against democracy, the democratic recession. Thank you very much. I want to thank Romaina. I want to thank Unitz. I want to thank Martin and Peter. I also want to thank my partners, Natalia Hotel Belan, who runs our Europe program at site, and Martina Horoblova, somewhere hiding there, who organized this panel for us. Oh, she's right there. So thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of the day.